Hey folks, Mark Yerkes here coming to you from Bergama, Turkey. This is the location of the ancient city of Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2, one of the seven churches of Asia. So stand by for another interesting episode of Obscure Christian History. Perhaps no book of the Bible gathers more interest from Christians and non-Christians alike than the revelation of Jesus Christ. While the Apostle John was exiled on the island of Patmos for his testimony, he wrote, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Seven churches would receive individual counsel that pertained to their time and to the events yet to come for all mankind. Therefore, as the Scripture commands, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The third church mentioned was that founded in Pergamum, or as some call it, Pergamon. Located in northwest Turkey, the magnificent ruins of its Acropolis can be visited high above the village of Bergama. And even today, visitors can see the village beyond what remains of a circular gateway. But there is no reason to exhaust oneself by climbing the Acropolis. A short uphill walk from the village below brings visitors to the base of a cable car system that will carry them up the steep incline that helped protect the city. Pergamum was considered such a safe location that shortly after its founding, in the 6th century BC, its main purpose was to act as a treasury for the Mycenaean region. The city was ruled independently, though under the Persian Empire's protection for centuries, until Alexander the Great conquered Asia Minor and began the transition to Greek influence. But another world power was soon on the rise. In 133 BC, King Attalus III, having no heir, bequeathed the city to the expanding Roman Empire. The Romans adopted the Greek deities and did not interfere in the manner of worship. They did, however, add at least one new so-called god. Pergamum became recognized by Rome as an important center of the emperor worship cult. It was already so when the Apostle John wrote the Revelation, but came to its zenith a couple of decades later. I'm standing here within what was called the Temple of Trajan, so-called because it was built by the Emperor Trajan at the beginning of the second century AD. But it not only honored him as part of the imperial cult, but also his successor, Hadrian. Both had statues within the temple that were separated by a statue of Zeus. Now, we don't know which emperor this represents because, well, he's missing his head. But we do know that it created a great deal of anxiety and problems for the Christians who lived in Pergamum. It was considered disloyal not to honor the emperor as a god, the lord of the earth and the seas. Well, of course, a Christian could only have one lord, and that is Jesus Christ. So they were considered disloyal and could face severe persecution and problems as a result. For that reason, Christ's warning to the Pergamum church centered around faithfulness to God no matter the cost. Faithfulness to God's sovereignty. Faithfulness to the truth in spite of persecutions. Faithfulness to the very end. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. 
I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon, and war against them with the sword of my mouth. The one who sends this warning is he who has a double-edged sword. Earlier, John makes clear that this person mentioned is the glorified Son of God, and the sword itself may be described by the author of the letter to the Hebrews. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The church would have been well instructed in the scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures were available. The four Gospels had been written and distributed. The letters of the Apostles Paul and Peter and James were copied, and John the Beloved had himself overseen the spiritual growth of all the Asian congregations. The Christians of Pergamum knew perfectly well what God expected of them, even though they lived in a center of paganism. When Jesus writes to the church in Pergamum that they are residing in the place where Satan's throne is, he may have been referring to the imperial cult temple. Of course, the imperial cult and all of the emperors believed that they were God. So it's understandable that he may have been referring to this place as Satan's throne. But whether it was the temple to the emperor or even the great altar to Zeus, which was built on a plateau below the temple of Athena, these were all dedicated unknowingly to Satan, whose desire has always been to be worshipped upon his own throne in place of the Almighty God. A visual tour of Pergamum, both its current ruins and the artistic representations of their original appearance, help us to understand the allure of idolatry. The temples were beautiful and magnificent in size, thus giving one the impression that they were in a place where gods were present, which made the worshippers themselves feel small and needful in comparison. At the same time, Pagan festivals appealed to mankind's baser instincts. Ceremonies often involved drunkenness, drugs, and sexual immorality without guilt to prove one's devotion. Then there was also the promise of favor from the gods. Whatever one's desires or needs might be, there was a god who supposedly could answer prayers, if placated with the proper offerings. There were also status and the financial benefits to be gained. As a member of the common religion, one obtained preferences in society and in business. To reject the common religion was to be suspect and excluded. All of these aspects of idolatry amount to the three categories of sin that Satan always appeals to. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the sinful pride of life. It should not be surprising then that the Church of Pergamum would find itself persecuted. 
the faithful believers would not become part of or validate the common religion. Neither would devout Christians participate in the religious acts of fornication or share in their collective shame, and so they would be rejected by society. Christians became outcast and would suffer financial loss. Jesus had a commendation for the church in Pergamum. In spite of persecution and even the death and martyrdom of one of their own, Antipas, they had held firmly to the faith and not denied Jesus Christ. But he also had a reprimand. It seems that even though they were faithful, they were tolerating some amongst them who were teaching false doctrines, the doctrine of Balaam, which was telling people that it was okay to eat food, sacrifice to idols, and to engage in fornication as part of the worship of the idolatry. This could not be tolerated. <laughs> These were sexually immoral people who participated in the pagan festivals and gladly ate the meat sacrificed to idols, yet they would still claim to be part of God's church. Also within the church were those teaching the false doctrine of the Nicolaitans, who believed it was okay to live with one foot in Christianity and the other in the world. These people were an offense to God and Jesus promised to visit judgment upon them if they did not repent. The offenders needed to follow Christ alone, but the faithful believers also needed to repent and separate themselves from idolaters, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Earthquakes eventually did put an end to Pergamum, but they certainly did not put an end to the tactics of Satan, which are still employed in our own time and culture. It is a mistake to regard the spiritual struggles of the Pergamum church as something unrelated to our own. We may no longer be pressured to cling to idols of stone and precious metals as existed in the first century but we have idols nonetheless. Whatever we put ahead of or in place of God is an idol, whether it be money, pleasures, possessions, positions, or anything else. Believers in God must remember that we no longer belong to ourselves. We were purchased at a price through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the reward for faithfulness to the end will be well worth the hardships. The final words of the message to the church in Pergamum applies equally to us. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. I don't know about you folks, but I am looking forward to tasting some of that hidden manna and finding out what name is written on that invitation to the feast of Jesus Christ, that white stone, that name that only Christ knows and I will know. So in the meantime, let's continue to live for Jesus Christ. Join us again as we do more episodes of Obscure Christian History. And don't forget to subscribe Click the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, and send us your comments. May God bless.